Thank you, Donna. Um, first of all, really honoured to be invited to ask, uh, to, to speak to you all. Um, certainly, I didn't think I was a chance to win the Young Alumnus Award. Um, I went to the, even, uh, the um, awards evening last year with my wife and we had a bit of a joke on the way there that, oh, this is great, well, a night away from the kids and staying up in Brisbane, we'll go for a few drinks, a bit of a dance afterwards, I didn't think I'd win. So um, it was certainly a surprise. <clears throat> Before I start today, just to, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the, of the land on which we meet today. Um, and also just um, to put some of my presentation into context, um, I'm an Indigenous man, my people are Barungam. Um, excuse me, a little bit of a blocked nose. My, uh, the Brungham people are the traditional uh, people of the Chinchilla Darling Downs area, which is in uh, southwestern Queensland. Um, and, and my heritage was pretty much unknown to me up until, uh, un until my early 20s. Um, it took a death in the family actually to find out. I was really interested in it and I was actually very proud um, of, of that discovery. Um, so I decided to look into that a little bit further and the interesting thing was um, growing up as a kid I'd often visit uh, my grandparents out in Chinchilla. So on my dad's side of the family, um, that was where the, the heritage came into it, my dad's dad's side of the family, my dad's mum uh, was of white German descent. So what would happen was I'd go out to Chinchilla with my parents and I'd stay with my grandparents, white German grandparents, um, didn't know anyone out there and I'd go and kick, the, uh, kick my footy over at the, um, the cemetery across the road and there was nowhere else to go, nothing else to do out in Chinchilla. Um, when I found out about my heritage and researched it, found out it was my great-great-great-grandmother, was a full-blooded Aboriginal woman born on the banks of the Condamine River in Chinchilla. And um, when, when the Indigenous folk uh, passed away back then, they didn't give them a proper headstone, they gave them a, a number in the dirt. Um, I found that number, and would you believe it was the exact same place I used to kick the ball as a kid? Yeah, so I, I think um, a, a lot of that um, resonates with me, that connection to country. Um, and, and that's why I, I particularly loved working in Logan, because we, we do have quite a high percentage of um, Indigenous families enrolling at the school. So, um, my family as well. So, uh, I'm a dad to two girls, Kira's 14. Jay is nine. Um, my wife is a teacher. She works at Helensvale State School. So you can imagine um, Friday night in the Hartley household. So exciting talking about spelling and word lists and, and assessment. Lots of fun. Um, and it is about um, leading a culture of, uh, of learning in Logan. But I also really want to um, <coughs> focus today on um, a relentless commitment to improvement. Because um, during my time in Logan, that was something that uh, we had no choice but to really um, commit to um, improving outcomes for all students. And a lot of that's going to be um, included in my th uh, the, theme, um, the, theme of, the theme of today as well. So the WALTS, this afternoon the WALTS, um, if we're talking about explicit teaching, WALTS stands for We Are Learning To. Probably this afternoon it's more We Are Learning About. Um, the challenges and successes that you know I've, I've experienced um, during my time in Logan, uh, the importance of relationships based on high, high expectations. Um, high expectations will also play a, a major part in my presentation today. Um, high expectations of myself, of students, of families, and also the, the expectations that they have of me as a, as a leader, as a school leader. Um, we're going to talk about learning to listen, really important in, in communities in Logan, learning to listen, um, having helpful distractions and also having fun at work. That's, that's one of my uh, passions, to have a bit of fun at work and be a bit naughty. Um, and this afternoon, um, the WILF, so this is what I'm looking for, please don't fall asleep. Um, and we've got a little one to keep us awake anyway. <laughs> Um, please don't throw tomatoes at me. Um, they, these are my experiences only, so take, take from my experiences what you will, okay? Um, and take notes, do whatever, you, do, do whatever you want, and if you have to get up and move around, that's fine as well. Um, so just a bit about um, my career. I started my career at uh, Labrador State School. Um, the funny thing was I was a kid uh, from preschool all the way through to grade seven at Labrador. I, attend, I, I attended there. Um, and my past principal um, got in touch with me when he found out that I'd graduated from Griffith. 
and he wanted to have a bit of a chat. Um, I went up and spoke to him and half an hour later I got a call from regional office and uh, the lady thought she'd be really funny and she said, uh, Dave, we've got your job, um, it's out at Dirabandi. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's, that's cool, I'll go there. She said, no, only joking, uh, would you like to work at Labrador? I said, oh, of course, yeah, great. So I spent um, nine years pretty much working at Labrador as a classroom teacher, met my wife there, um, so that was probably the, the highlight of working at Labrador. Um, I'm glad we're filming this too because then I have proof that I actually said that. <laughs> um, I taught a range of grades. I, I started teaching grade five. I went to grade four for a few years. Um, my favourite year level to teach was grade one. I taught grade one for three years and I, I soon found out that you have to um, pretty much be a wiggle for uh, six hours of the day so that was exhausting. And during my first year of teaching grade one, um, we had our second child. So that was, um, that was an interesting year. There was, I was um, certainly sleep deprived. Um, from Labrador, I, 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 had, I had other ambitions. I knew I wanted to move into leadership, but um, I, I wanted to, you know, I didn't get bored of teaching in the classroom, but I just knew I had other skills that I, I, I needed to develop. I went into a numeracy coach role and I was shared between Merrimack and Canindra Bar State Schools. Um, an interesting job, a job I enjoyed, uh, but a job I felt a little bit pigeonholed and frustrated in as well because um, although I had a, t a passion for teaching maths and working closely with teachers to develop pedagogy, um, I knew I had a little bit more to offer. I didn't want to be pigeonholed just as that maths guy. Um, so there were a heap of uh, job applications going out and a lot of the, the, those applications were acting D DP roles. Um, in Logan, so I applied for one at um, at Waterford West, and I'd forgotten all about the application because I must have applied for probably you know five or six, and then um, I remember the day a lady calls me and it's Di Carter. She introduces herself as the the principal of Waterford West State School, and um, she said we'd like you to um, come and have a tour of the school and. If everything works out, we'd like you to come and work for us for a term and see how things go. And she said, how do you think you'd go working in Logan? And I said, oh, no, it'd be, it'd be sweet. To, I, I, taught, I taught at Labrador. And, you know, when I first taught at Labrador, you know, I was just saying to Daniel, um, well, I had kids throwing desks and chairs down hallways. I thought, if I can handle that, I can handle Logan. So uh, I said that to Di, I said, no, I'll be fine. And she said, all right, okay. And my first week of working at Waterford West, she said, is it still like Labrador? I said, no, it's not like Labrador. It's much tougher than Labrador. But um, Di Carter is someone who I very much call a mentor and a, and a good friend. Um, and I'm very gr grateful that she gave me the chance to really cut my teeth in, in, lead in leadership, especially um, in a Logan school. She's a very wise leader. That's a picture of Di there. Um, Di is a huge uh, advocate of embedding um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander perspectives into, into the curriculum. Um, and one thing I'm really proud of with Di, instead of um, you know, having Chinese or Japanese or um, Spanish as, as the school's lote, she chose the local Indigenous language, Yugambeh language, to be the school's lote. So uh, every week, um, every class goes to their specialist uh, lote teacher, Uncle Gary Crosby, and he teaches the indigenous um, Yugambeh language as, um, as the language of choice there. Um, Di used to call her team the dream team, um, and it was the dream team because uh, when Di first started at, at Waterford West, it was, a, it was um, during national partnerships, really tough time. Uh, there were certain goals and targets that the school had to meet in terms of academic performance, attendance and behaviour. And so when Di first started there, she knew she had a big job on her hands and she needed to um, fill the admin team with the, with the right people. I came in a little bit late in on that journey. It was uh, around mid-2010 and she'd started in 2009. So a lot of that hard work had been, had been done. Um, and again, she called it the dream team. That's not, that's not my term at all. Um, Di was a, is a big advocate of strength-based leadership. So um, the strength-based leadership, you look at the people that are, are right to do that job. If she couldn't find an expert in, in, a, in an area that she needed, she'd create an expert. Okay, she'd, she'd sort of wing it. Um, 
and her, ex her expectations of, of the leadership team were really high. If, if Di tasked you with something, you would jump through hoops to get it done. Um, she was that type of uh, inspirational leader. So um, you'll, you'll hear me talk a little bit about Di in the, in the first half of my presentation. Um, what you're looking at here is taken straight from the MySchool website. So this is public, everybody has access to it. Um, and this is 2014 ICSIA data for Waterford West State School. Now, remember I started in 2010. The ICSIA data um, basically is an indication of um, parents' um, access to secondary and tertiary education. Okay, it's an indicator of the, the education, the access to education that parents have had. Um, you can see the average ICSIA value nationally is 1,000. Uh, Waterford West's uh, ICSIA value is 909, so it's well below, and that was in 2014. 2010, um, it would have, and 2009 would have been um, slightly lower. Um, you can see the school distribution. You've got the majority, oh, well, over half of the um, the families in that in that bottom quartile. So um, very uh, challenging environment. Uh, lots of lots of families who um, struggle financially. Um, some, some issues around drug and alcohol abuse as well. So certainly a challenging environment to work in. Um, and that's just to give you some context around, around the data that I'm going to start talking to in a second. Um, we had a huge commitment to improvement at Waterford West and, and we had to. Um, but it was, a, it was a little bit like uh, working in a hurricane uh, because you had behaviour that you, you were dealing with. Um, there'd be kids coming to school who um, you know, we, ha we had a lovely little boy um, who would come to school and um, Dad's method of behaviour management at home was to put a crossbow against his head. You know, they were the sorts of things we were dealing with. Um, so we'd have these kids who were experiencing some terrible things at home, but they'd come to school because they knew it was a safe place and they loved coming to school. That made our job easier, I guess, but we still had, um, we, su we had such low academic data that we really needed to improve. That shaded area um, is the time that Di was principal at Waterford West. And you're looking at the year three NAPLAN results um, from 2008 through to 2014 and the year five NAPLAN reading results. And you can see that shift, that, that, that um, slight trajectory of improvement there. It's a really, really tough thing to do in a, in a low SES school. Um, and that was something that we were really proud of, that level of, that rate of improvement. Um, I'm going to show you Woodridge North very shortly as well because I ended up at Woodridge North um, a couple of years later. But um, the, maths is, the maths is similar. So to get, to get it to that point in t from 2009, we had a bit of a spike in 2008, which we, I think nationally we did. Um, you can see it went down in 2009, but again, getting that getting that slight traje trajectory of improvement even in year five as well. So it doesn't look like a lot, but gee, that was, that was bloody hard work, very hard work. Um, when I was working at uh, Waterford West and working with a lot of um, Indigenous families, um, I met a guy who um, was very grateful for meeting um, and has made a, made a big uh, mark on on my professional practice, and, and his name is uh, Chris Sarra. Um, he's written a book, and some of you may have, may have um, seen Chris before or seen him present. I won't read that to you, but um, he's, he's very big on um, high expectation, um, education based on high expectations, especially in regards to working in Indigenous schools and Indigenous families. Um, one thing I like about Chris is that he's done extension, ex extensive research in that field um, and, I'll, and I'll share some of his uh, readings soon. But you saw our, our ICSIA data, how low it was. Um, getting that rate of improvement in a school such as w Waterford West was, was really tough. But the only way that we could do it was to have high expectations um, of our students and our families. Uh, and we had to rattle a few cages. There are a lot of parents who um, initially were, were saying, well, why are you putting so much pressure on, on our kids to, to, to do reading at home? Why are you putting pressure on us to, to read with our families? Um, and, and the simple answer was, well, if, if we're not going to put that pressure on you, who else is going to do it? Okay. Um, and so in, in many ways it made, 
it made families and parents especially accountable um, for their children's education, but also put the accountability back on our teachers as well. And we really had to move away from that approach where we were focused solely on behaviour, on improving behaviour. Um, we had started to do that. The behaviour had started to improve. Our teachers were absolutely experts in managing behaviour, but we really had to lead learning and have high expectations of um, what we were actually teaching and our data. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place here. I'm just going to read you part of this book. Um, and, it, and it talks about um, some of the challenges that he, had, that he came up against and it resonated with me because they were the same sorts of challenges that, that, that I came up against working at, at Waterford West initially. Um, so Chris, to put this into context, Chris um, has just started working at Sherberg State School, um, a huge Indigenous community, and he's the, the first, I think he was the first Indigenous principal in Queensland. Um, he's been given the position, and again, um, I'll, I'll, read the, I'll read it to you. In the past, when the stakes were low, I had been guilty of keeping the peace by being polite and not engaging seriously with questions of racism or deficit thinking about Aboriginal people, particularly in the assumption that something is wrong with them. In this circumstance, however, the stakes were too high and I had to lead the school out of its toxic status quo towards a more productive direction that offered integrity. After six months in the job, having sat back and observed for long enough, I was feeling a little more comfortable about challenging them. My colleagues clearly did not like this. We entered mediation discussions with district office people and the union representative for Wide Bay and the teachers would accuse me of not valuing them and the work that they did. My, my relationship with most of them was strained and they were right in some ways about what I thought of their methods. I could not and would not feign appreciation for their efforts in a school uh, where children in year seven could not read. One senior teacher described innovation as having a liberal classroom in which students were set two literacy tasks, a numeracy task and a fun task. The students could choose whichever one they wanted to work on and if they finished all the tasks by lunchtime, then they got free time in the afternoon. This was certainly an incentive to complete tasks, but on my calculation, it was an incentive to complete the tasks, but... Um, Sorry, this was certainly an incentive to complete the task, but on my calculation, it meant that if a child had completed four tasks every morning, they would get five hours of free time in the week. In a school where the data screamed out for the need to maximise every second of learning time, I could not value it. I also despised watching on as each non-Indigenous teacher had the latest and greatest computers in their classrooms while the Aboriginal teachers had the old computers or no computers. It was clear that the new, as the new computers came in, they went to the white teachers who always had some way to explain how this was appropriate. I could not value a situation in which senior teachers on staff either had uh, little or no serious lesson term or semester planning for their classes, or if they did, it was usually the same folder with the same photocopies of work that I had observed the year before. This didn't make sense to me, particularly as the year before had delivered poor student outcomes with plenty of data proving how ineffective the planning was. On challenging teachers about why the data on student performance or attendance was so poor, they would often lay the blame on parents whom they said did not value education or the home life of the children because it was so complex or the community because it was so dysfunctional or the tests for not being relevant or the district office for not understanding how tough it was for them. The, li the list of people or things to blame went on and on but there was no point where we could put up a mirror and ask what needs to be changed? How might we be contributing to the endemic failure? It was obvious to me that we had little or no control over the things that they listed. We controlled only what we did in our school inside the classrooms and inside our relationships with the children. In those relationships, we had to be hardworking, innovative and excellent. His book's called um, Good Morning, Mr. Sarah. It's a fantastic read. And although um, that centered a lot around um, the relationships that he had with the white teachers and the Aboriginal teachers, what I really took out of that was um, that blame game. And, and that was certainly something that I had experience with uh, when I first started at Waterford West. 
a lot of the blame was put on the families, on the parents, um, on the, you know, where the kids were being brought up. But we weren't questioning what we're actually teaching or, or how we were teaching. Um, so that was um, a huge improvement agenda for our leadership team to really critically analyse um, our curriculum and, and how we were delivering it. Um, so that's where the high expectations of ourselves and others came in and, and we basically had to say, hey, listen, the buck stops with us, okay? We, we can't continue this blame game anymore. Um, a really good example of that, and he talked about the free time uh, that the, the kids were having um, like five hours a week. That was one thing I noticed. When I first started working there, we had, a, we had two teachers, um, team teaching set up, and uh, if everything had been done uh, if the, the maths lesson had been completed successfully and the English lesson, there was gold, it was called golden time in the afternoon. So golden time, again, it was five hours a week of golden time. Um, and when I went in and had a quiet chat with the teachers and said, listen, just, just tell me how golden time works and what are you looking to get out of golden time? Oh, well, you know, we, we just mark our, we mark our assessment and the kids, you know, they're rewarded for getting their work done. And, and I said, well, that's just not acceptable. It's not good enough and it needs to stop. Um, and I, and I, I was strategic with the people that I targeted because I knew that once I went and had that conversation with those two teachers, word would spread. And so very quickly, um, people felt challenged, but they also saw what we were trying to do as well. Um, and luckily had the support of Di backing us and um, we really didn't look back from there. But those first few months, especially having those conversations were, were really, really tough. Um, and I lost a, a bit of sleep around that as well. Um, the high expectations around behavior. Um, one, I remember one day I had um, Mr. Bansraj, lovely man, lived across the road, had two kids at the school. Um, and he, <laughs> He came in and uh, the, the ladies in the office called me and said, Mr. Hartley, you better get down here. Mr. Mr. Bansaraj is a bit upset. And um, I went down and said, Mr. Bansaraj, would you like to come up to my office and we can, uh, we can talk about you know, your concerns quietly. He came in and he threw the, um, threw the courier mail on my desk. And the courier mail had just published the, um, the latest suspension data for all of the schools in Logan. And Waterford West suspension data was, was the highest. We'd suspended about... Oh, we would have suspended about 300 students um, in the, in the, during the course of the year. And he was outraged because the behaviour was terrible. We had to suspend 300 students. And I had to put a different spin on it to Mr Bansaraj and get him to understand that um, we're actually taking a really hard line on behaviour and we're lifting our expectations. We have high expectations around behaviour and if a child comes to the school and they misbehave or if they swear at a teacher or if they choose to throw a, a desk or a chair, they're suspended because we need to start looking at those students who actually do want to be at the school. We need to send a clear message to parents who aren't engaging in the education of their children. And um, he was fine. He, he saw what we were trying to do and he thanked me profusely, took the courier mail, put it under his arm and walked off. And um, <laughs> And, and when it was Diwali, uh, when, um, Diwali is, uh, Diwali, does, can someone tell me what Diwali is? Because I'd like to be able to explain it. Hindu festival. And they make lots of nice sweets. Yes. Yeah. So next time Diwali came around, I had a lovely big platter of uh, Hindu sweets on my desk from Mr. and Mrs. Bansraj. So it was lovely. So the parents were starting to see what we were trying to do, especially in terms of, in terms of behaviour. And that was really key to, to um, start improving student outcomes because we know that you won't have any success le learning in the classroom unless, unless you get the behaviour right. Um, and at Waterford West, we really needed to improve our maths data. And me having that numeracy coach background, um, that was the main reason I had been employed there by Di, was to uh, really lead um, our improvement agenda in maths. Um, and I had to establish some credibility in terms of curriculum at the school as well. That was really important for me. So um, I had to do the research. I started the planning. Um, and I had to really start, if we're talking about strength-based leadership, I really had to start recruiting the right teachers to help me as well. So I identified a couple of uh, key teachers who were demonstrating best practice in terms of maths. And they helped me move that forward. Um, and it's my belief that if you have teachers um, leading those agendas, running professional development, 
um, you'll get you'll gain momentum and they'll they'll own um, those programs they'll own the data and you'll have more people wanting to um, take take part in in your improvement agenda so that was something that I had to do um, after we improved our behavior um, we've talked about this book here um, I won't go about I won't go into that one I, I wanted to talk about, this is my thing that I came up with, the three C's um, to visible leadership, okay? Um, and it's about being a, being a visible leader is about enacting change, and it's not something that just happens in the classroom. Um, Chris Sarah, in his book, he talks about walking the talk, um, and, and I guess this is when it happens. When you are a leader of a school, you've got people looking up to you, you've got students, parents wanting direction, um, and being visible, is um, extremely important. My three C's start with um, being visible in the classroom. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons why I like to have a, a big presence in the classroom. The, the first one is to make that connection with the kids, to show that you actually care, you care about their learning, you're not just the, 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 the grumpy guy in the office uh, dealing with behaviour all the time, you're the one going into the classrooms, getting down um, on the same levels as the kids, um, reading with them, um, engaging in their mathematical learning, that's the sort of leader that I want to be. So I, I, I want to be visible, I want to be making those relationships with the students, but I also want the teachers to understand that I actually care about what's happening in the classroom. I, I care about how they're delivering a certain subject. I care about, um, I, I care if, if I go into their room and four times in a row I sit, see them sitting behind their computer and there's no explicit teaching. So I want them to care, um, and I want them to know that I care as well. So the first one is, is um, being visible in the classroom. Um, and the car park, really important. And, and it's probably um, one of the most active places in your school, okay, before and after. I'm not just talk, talking about traffic, I'm talking about the talk, and the talk comes from, I call it the car park mafia. Okay, because the car park mafia, they see you walking down and they've all got something to say about you. So when you're working in a challenging environment like Waterford West, um, you really want to shift that deficit talk into positive talk um, amongst the parents. Um, an interesting thing that happened to me, um, I, was playing, I was playing touch footy and, and we'd made the, the final of, of um, Division 2 and I was really stoked with that. And... Um, one, one night we were, play, we were playing the, the grand final and my mate Stubbsy has thrown me a fantastic cutout pass and I've dived it, uh, sorry, I've caught, I've caught it and dived at the same time, scored a try, rolled my hand in, thinking, um, great, but my finger's a bit sore. I get up and look at my finger, my wedding, my wedding ring finger, and it was completely dislocated. It was out on a 90 degree angle. Um, I popped it back in and kept playing. And the, the only problem was when I went to put my wedding ring on the next morning, um, it wouldn't fit. But um, I'd had the wedding ring off for oh, probably a good month. And so I had the head of the car park mafia come up to me after school. And <laughs> she said, Mr. Hartley, we know all about your little secret. And I'm thinking, oh God, which one? <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, Danielle, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? And she said, uh, we hear you've separated from your wife. <laughs> and, and I didn't know, I, I had no idea what she was talking about. I said, oh, wh where did you get that idea? Because I promise you I haven't separated from my wife. Oh, we've noticed that um, you're not wearing your wedding ring, any, uh, wedding ring anymore. And I said, oh, I said, well, listen, not that I have to justify this, but the reason for me not wearing the wedding ring is blah, blah, blah. I told her the story about the touch football. Oh, okay. And so I've, t I've turned away to pretend I'm going to bus duty. She's run down and told all the, all, all the women <laughs> that, no, no, he's married. It's okay. <laughs> so having that presence in the car park is really important too because you, you establish, and, and you know those parents that um, you've been trying to catch up with about um, their, their children's lack of attendance or concerns that you have. Um, when they're getting in a car with their kids, there's really no escape, especially if you do the old current affair trick and sort of stand in the, stand in the door before they try and close it. So um, it's, a, it's a good way to try and corner some parents as well if you want to have some serious conversations. Um, but the other one too, which is really important, is community. Um, 
and in the community, um, you can create such a strong presence and you can, you can sell your school. Um, I think that's really important because, um, you know, at, at, at Waterford West and at Woodridge North, both um, Logan schools that I've worked at, um, when I first started teaching there, they, they, were, they were really a, um, a, they were a school of convenience, not a school of choice. And so um, getting out and making, making those waves in the community, um, having a positive presence in the community, it, 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 it generates discussion. And especially when we think of Logan, you've got your little pockets. And, and I was wor working you know, with Waterford West and Woodridge North. Um, although it seems like a big area, everybody knows each other. And so we're really, we're really able to turn our, our reputation around. Um, and in the community as well, people know that you care. Myself and uh, my other deputy at Waterford West, Alan Tharano, we would often have to go and do house visits because we knew that students weren't attending um, or we had other concerns. If the parents weren't answering the phone, we'd have to go and knock on the door. And um, I remember a, a number of times going into um, you know, units or unit blocks. We look like Starsky and Hutch getting out of our car and walking down the car park and people would sort of be peering through the curtains and quickly <laughs> closing the doors because they thought we were the cops. Uh, but, um, you know, word gets out and, and, and people understand that you are trying to, um, you know, continually improve your school. So that were the three C's of um, visible leadership. Um, but if we're talking about establishing a culture of high expectations, at Waterford West, um, the staff were, were, were challenged, they were supported as well. Uh, you know, I had to do that fair, that fair bit of challenging. Uh, we have, we made a point of um, having PAC meetings. PAC meetings stands for uh, planning and assessment um, conversation meetings. So we'd look at teachers planning, we'd look at their assessment and, and we'd, you know, put a critical eye on it and we'd be supportive but we'd also ask those questions. Have you thought about, um, you know, if we're looking at Johnny's reading, have you thought about doing this? Which strategies, what sort of, what sort of feedback are you giving Johnny? Um, they were the sorts of questions we could ask. Um, one of those teachers that I told you about, I challenged them about the golden time. Um, she had a fantastic reputation on staff for being someone that could deal um, really well with behaviour. And a lot of parents wanted their, their children in, the, in this particular teacher's class because um, the kids loved her. And she was a Lovely person, still is a lovely person. But when we had our rolling meetings, our rolling meetings were based around our Pat Maths results. Pat Maths uh, is our progressive achievement test for, for Pat Maths. Um, she actually had some of the lowest results um, out of the whole school. And that was in the, in the first test. In the secondary test that we did um, two terms later, the results hadn't improved. And we would plot the scores on a, on a data wall. And when I sat down with her and, and you know, we had a, I had to challenge her and say, well, listen, um, the teacher two doors down, um, we've, we've looked at her effect size and it's this big, okay? Your, your, your children haven't moved. I wanna know what's happening in your classroom with maths. Um, are you changing anything? Are you changing your delivery? Um, let's talk about your pedagogy. That challenged her a lot and, and she broke down and she, she was really upset. She had to leave the meeting. Um, but to her credit, she came back the next day. She texted me that night. She said, I want to talk to you first thing before school starts. And um, she sat down and she said, Dave, um, I want some help. Tell me what I need to do to get these kids up. So that had a really positive outcome and I was really happy with, with how that meeting went. But, you know, we did challenge, but we're also very um, supportive as well. Um, we had to make it clear that everyone was accountable. Everyone is accountable for student outcomes. Um, we talked about consistency and practice and commitment to professional development, professional learning. And um, I guess we developed our staff to a point where we could really step back from leading that professional development. And we had probably a good 10 or 15 teachers that would continuously put their hand up to lead professional development around reading or writing or things that matter like, like math. So that was, that was a great place for us to be in. Um, and, and I think in any school too, when you talk about your teaching team, it's really important to include your teacher aides um, as part of that team. Um, in my opinion, gone are the days of having teacher aides laminating and cutting out um, flashcards. That's, that's a waste of money. Um, that's a waste of taxpayers' money and it's also 
in my in my opinion, um, demeaning to the teacher aid. Okay, um, they've got so much more to offer than that. So our teaching teams um, included our teacher aides, and they were really responsible for for lifting a lot of our reading results within our small groups. And they were an integral part of our um, improvement agenda there. Um, and we, have, uh, we had a big emphasis on, on being a team and acting as a team. And I'll just put a little screenshot of a, um, of, a sh of a shirt there. I was a little bit cheeky and wrote a letter to the mayor of Logan, Pam Parker, and I said, listen, Pam, um, you know, we're really big on uniform at our school. We're cracking down on uniform. Um, we, we really love seeing our kids arrive to school all dressed appropriately. We want to look like we're a big team, but we want our staff to look like a team as well. Can you give us some money for some staff shirts? So she wrote us a nice check and um, we kitted out the whole staff in, in shirts. And it was amazing the effect that it made. It sounds silly giving someone a shirt, but it really had a, a really profound effect on um, not so, well, on our teachers, but also our aides, because all of our teacher aides, of course, and our cleaners and our groundsmen all had the deadly, um, Water for West shirt, so little thing, but um, yeah, it was really important. The importance of relationships and communication. Um, this is really important too. I think when you're dealing with dealing with families in um, in low socioeconomic areas too, you quite often have parents that will approach the office in a really aggressive manner. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, and and some of those reasons, you know, could include they, they experienced anxiety. Um, within their own schooling. The school is in a positive place for them to be. They only send their kids to school because they know they have to. Um, they don't want to lose, um, they don't want to lose any of their, you know, their money coming in from the government. They don't want to be reported um, and they want to be seen to be doing the right thing. But you know, you do have some parents that come to the school um, baying for blood and they want to win. They want to win at all costs. Um, and quite often you'll have parents that will be raising a storm in the office and you'll need to bring them down into your room just to um, quiet them down. Um, one thing that happened to me was um, I, I had to put the pressure on a particular family because the kids weren't coming to school. Um, and there was one boy in grade five who um, just was basically refusing to attend. And poor mum, I have to say, I had to put the hard word on her. She really didn't know what to do. She came in, she stormed into my room and she basically said, um, she said, Mr Hartley, I've got four kids to get ready for school every day. I've got to take two to high school. I've got to bring two over here. Um, and they're not ready in, on time. You're getting up me, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can't penalise me. I'm going to report you to the regional office. You know, call me a few names. Um, and that was cool because I could see that she was upset. I had to give her some time to settle down. And I guess it's a bit of a, a tightrope act. You don't want to come across as condescending. Um, but you also, you, you need to show that you care. So I, I, I guess I waited for the dust to settle a bit and I said, you know, I, I see you're upset. And I made sure that um, I was listening to her. She had my full attention. Um, I said, sounds like you've got a lot on your plate at the moment. You've, you know, you, dad's, not, dad's not at home. You've got the two kids to take to high school. So I basically repeated her story so she knew that I'd listened to everything she said. Um, and it sounds like Jamal, um, Jamal's playing up a bit in the morning. Sounds like, you know, we need to do something about that. Yeah, yeah, we do, Mr Hartley, we sure do. And so, you know, I made a point of um, having some type of, uh, you know, relating things back to her. So I said, you know, when you and I were kids, you know, we'd have to get our lunch ready and, and ride to school. I said, yeah, 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 well, our kids don't do that. We, we baby them too much there. You know, we sook, we sook around for them, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, how about I have a bit of a man-to-man -man with Jamal and we can try and get something sorted with Jamal and, and I'll have a bit of a conversation with him today. Um, you bring him to school tomorrow, I'll meet you at the front gate, I'll make sure that he gets out of the car um, and you know, we'll put a reward in place for him as well. So if he can do that for three days straight, um, I'll, bring him, I'll bring him a um, six-inch subway to school. Okay, that will just start things off. So that was my, that was my ticket for Jamal, get him to school, give him a six-inch sub. Um, <laughs> And so it sounds silly, but you know, that was the carrot I had to dangle. Um, and we struck up a really good relationship. And I said to Jamal, it got to, the, it got to the point where I could say to him, mate, you know mum's struggling at home. You, you got your big brother and your big sister, she's got to get to school. Pull your head in, get your stuff ready, put your shoes on and make sure you, you're ready on time. Yeah, 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 I will. So we really didn't have a drama after that, but it was just, you know, it was just about listening to mum and, and listening to her concerns. But more importantly, she walked away feeling as though she'd had a win. Um, and that was really important because a lot of these parents, they just want to win. Uh, they don't get a win in life. You know, they've got the world against them. So 
they, um, they, they need to feel like they've, um, they've had a win against someone. Um, and it didn't mean that I was lowering my expectations at all, okay, because I said to mum, you know, Jamal's attendance is important, and you know, I don't want to have to be calling you every second day, but we need to get him here. So mum walked away feeling as though she'd won, but she also understood what, she, what we were trying to do. Um, and the most important thing, I think, is those positive phone calls to parents. So many of our parents are used to getting the negative phone calls. Can you come and pick your kid up? They belted someone. Um, I love giving the positive phone call because they, pick, they see it's a school and they pick it up and they just answer with so much trepidation. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> uh, listen, everything's cool. I'm just giving you a ring to say... Um, Malachi had a fantastic day today. Um, he got all of his maths done and he had to come and show me his work. I got to give him a sticker. So when he comes home, can you give him a bit of a pat on the back and, and tell dad as well? Because he'd love, some, he'd love a bit of a pat on the back from dad. Oh, yeah, 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 cool. All right, no problem. So those phone calls, um, they're really important for you to make because you, you walk away feeling good from those phone calls as well, um, the fact that you've, you've made them. Um, and if you say you're going to do something, you have to do it. Um, you know, like with, with Jamal's mum, um, I, I told her I was going to meet him at the front gate. I told her that I was going to give follow-up phone calls just to let her know about, you know, him getting to school on time and his attitude. Um, and I had to do that and, and she was really grateful for that. So if you make those promises, you really need to follow through. Um, I want to just quickly show you something that we did at, at Waterford West because Nothing like this had really been done before. We, we, we started our book week celebrations. And um, if you've ever been part of a book week or you've got a, you've got a child at home that you've had to dress for book week, you know how crazy book, book parade is. Um, but what we did is we, we uh, rigged up a big projector in the hall at Waterford West. And um, this is the video that we played as all the kids were um, just coming into the hall and settling down. And again, it's about remembering to have fun at work and, and poking a bit of fun at yourself and if you do that the kids see it the community can see it as well and they they go away and talk about it um, I have to apologize for this video quality's not great and I at this stage I'd never filmed on an iPhone before and I was one of those gumbies that that got everyone to film like that in portrait not in landscape so when you see it, you'll understand oh, I wish you didn't um, film in, in portrait so this was just a little bit of fun that we had at Waterford West Um, yeah, so I do like to have a bit of fun. I think it's really important to poke a bit of fun at yourself, especially when you work in a school like Waterford West and Woodridge North. If you take yourself too seriously, they're going to eat you up and, and spit you out. My new challenge is being uh, Deputy Principal at Coomera Springs State School, which is on the coast. Um, very interesting school to work at. Um, I don't have the challenges that I had at Waterford West and Woodridge North. Um, my challenge is probably at the moment revolve around a bit of complacency that I've noticed within the staff. Um, I have staff coming to me telling me how difficult the clientele are, um, how much the parents don't care. Mm -hmm. And I have to say to them, listen, we've got parents coming into the school, they've all got shoes on. Um, <laughs> you know, they, but, but they, they care, they're, they're bringing their kids to school every day. They say, well, you know, I've got, I've got this boy down here and uh, he ran away from me yesterday. I think we need to call a meeting with, with mum and dad and uh, everyone else. And I said, well, well, well let's, just, let's just take it easy. So I really wonder how they would handle working at a school, a really uh, high complex school such as Waterford West or, or Woodridge North. So I think, um, I think we've got a lot to celebrate in Logan in terms of um, our teachers and our kids and our families. Um, uh, certainly our children have so much to offer. We come from such, they come from such a diverse cultural background. Um, when I first started teaching, at, uh, sorry, Deputy Principal at Woodridge North, that was just after the riots between the Tongan community and the Indigenous community. And so I, had, I was very apprehensive about working there. Um, but when I first started, I realised that the kids didn't buy into any of that. They are all good mates. And, and that's what really struck me about working in Woodridge North, just the, the harmony and, uh, b between all children and all families. Um, but our teachers are certainly something that we should be celebrating in, in Logan uh, because if they can teach well and improve outcomes in Logan, they can teach, I think they can teach anywhere in the world. Um, so working at, at Coomera Springs, some new challenges for me. Um, our data, I have to say, our data isn't great. Woodridge North's data at the moment looking much better than Coomera Springs. Coomera Springs is an independent public school. 
Um, and if you look at our Ixia data at Coomera Springs, we've got most of our families sitting in that um, first or second quartile. Mm. So we've got a lot to do around um, improving pedagogy, but we've got a young and enthusiastic staff and, and I know we're going to get there. Um, just quickly, I talked about having helpful distractions. I have a couple of passions out there. I have a passion outside of um, education and my family and I am an author. Um, I've written um, a book, I'm the co-author of the Deadly Dean Justice Jones series with, with Scotty Prince, who um, is an ex-NRL player. Um, and we're really passionate about improving um, levels of literacy, especially in our, in our young boys. Um, we started writing the books um, because we, we use an Indigenous character, Dylan. Um, this is Dylan here, young Aboriginal boy from Mount Isa. Um, and we really wanted an Aboriginal role model to, um, to help kids understand that it's, it's okay to be a good reader. It's okay to be good at maths. You should be able to celebrate your, your academic achievements. So D uh, Dylan is actually the, um, the school spelling champ. And um, Justice Jones, his little Kiwi mate there, is a school maths champ. So we include a few subtle messages in our books, but they all centre around rugby league. Um, and Dylan actually has a, has a bit of a secret. He's a little bit like the Incredible Hulk. When he gets angry, he turns into a full-grown man. So during the week, he goes to Flatwater State School. Um, and on the weekends, he plays for the Brisbane Broncos as, De as Deadly D, the next Indigenous superstar. Um, so we've, we've got our third book coming out in October. Scott and I are good mates. Um, we, we started writing together um, probably in 2009 um, and we, we're, we're roughly the same age. We, we share a lot of um, similarities. Um, we both started playing football at a young age. Obviously um, Scott, um, captain of the Titans for, for a number of years. Um, I was a mascot for the Titans. <laughs> I got the sack. I won't go into what. I, I didn't get the sack. My, my sidekick aluminium boy got, this, got us the sack. So, um, but that was good fun while it lasted. Um, Scott's got two young girls. That's not his wife, Christy, in the middle. <laughs> uh, and I've got a young family too. So Scott and I get, really well, uh, get on really well. We're good writing buddies and, and I guess um, we're both really passionate about improving, um, improving uh, reading outcomes for, for young boys. A lot of girls enjoy our book as well, which is, which is really positive too. And um, we've got, book, as I said, book three coming out in October and, and I illustrate as well. So they're just a couple of the, um, our, our, the sketches that I've done. Um, we've got Socks and Jocks, the evil clowns. We wanted to include evil clowns in the third book. And that's the big baddie, the ringmaster. So um, if you get that book in October, you can read all about uh, Socks and Jocks and and Deadly Dean and Justice Jones. Thank you everybody for having me tonight. Really enjoyed it and very, uh, very much an honor to present. Thank you. <laughs>